Okay, so this question just came up for me. Hold on. Let's get this adjusted. Okay, so this question just came up for me about social anxiety and avoidant attachment style. And I wonder how much we confuse the two. I wonder how much the two are actually really related and how it's it's talking about the elephant as like a hose, a rope, and a tree trunk, right? Is that is it all just part of the same elephant when people say they have social anxiety or when we say somebody has an avoidant uh, attachment style? I, from what I'm learning about attachment styles, particularly the avoidant tendencies, is that it's a self-protective and sometimes other protective response that is basically fueled by shame, despair, confusion, overwhelm, desperation, right? It's this sort of floundering survival response you would expect to see in somebody who is, say, drowning. Although, when we're drowning, it doesn't really look like you think it does. Anyway, that sort of flailing about and, like, trying to keep our head above things, that's more the state a person's in when they're having, de like, their deactivation strategies are triggered, when that, that process that causes um, a person to kind of shut down and withdraw and push people away. <clears throat> pardon me, that's usually coming from a place of anxiety, and like I said, to protect oneself and others from what seems like inevitable harm. And even if there's not real harm, it could be that the individual has experienced a great deal of pain from what is similar to what they are observing at hand. And to spare themselves and others from that pain, from that place of fear and hopelessness and confusion, they kind of like pull back and push away. Well, what does that sound like? It sounds like we're afraid to go into a social situation and to engage with others. We're afraid we'll offend people or show them how shameful we are or somehow like be humiliated or hurt by the experience or we'll do something that might cause somebody else to feel hurt right and so this fear of that happening the scenario that we're playing in our heads ends up being the reason we say I'm, I can't go into the social setting I have social anxiety how is that really different ultimately I think those are two parts of the same complex of responses that people develop in the way that it was at one time adaptive and functional and really helped in its its time and the place where it was originated, but having not been updated has become maladaptive and, and poorly suited to the circumstances at hand. And this is why I have a lot of interest in this because even though what I'm describing is something that comes from great fear and despair, I think there's great hope and, and security on the other side of understanding the patterns and using the models to sort of say, okay, this is what's going on. How can I work with these pieces to realize I'm not shameful. I have a right to be. We're all flawed. I'm not awful. I'm not going to go around wreaking havoc and leaving a wake of destruction everywhere I go. I'm not so offensive that it's, it's noxious and odious of me to even impose myself on others, right? Or that others are such a threat that I can't take a chance on any of them because nobody's trustworthy. These, these things we think when we have to say them out loud and look at them realistically, it becomes clear that this is a somewhat dramatic response of a childlike part of us, which is childish, really. Childlike is a little different, but I always think that means you come with wonder and, and openness, but childish is sort of puerile and like petulant and like, no, I'm not going to take a nap, right? <laughs> that energy. Um, that seems to be what's underlying a lot of these these thoughts and, and patterns that we establish and, and take for granted. And in going inside of that and seeing that, instead of saying, I have social anxiety, I can't do anything to take meds and let people know I'm like disabled and whatever, <laughs> or I, I, people with and avoid an attachment style, rarely get involved in addressing it. They like to avoid that as well, right? We, we like to step aside from things that are uncomfortable and require change because our systems are evolved to sort of set and forget, get in a good groove that works and stick with it. 
and changing that takes a certain amount of energy and sometimes discomfort or even pain so yeah people will avoid that but for people who are self-aware of what's going on they see what's happening and can sort of recognize that this is a, a, a sort of an inner child part that's been hurt and did it the best that that child could do with a child's resources and perspectives and experience to cope with something that was really overwhelming to the point that it kind of snapped off parts of the system, right? It was so powerful that the, the default is to say, better to assume it's a predator in the bush than a bird, right? It, it, one, you might miss, miss out on a chance to, to hunt something, but you're not the quarry. You're not going to end up the prey in that scenario and surviving to another day even on an empty stomach is still better than saying hey is that a bird and ending up dinner so we're going to always default to like the most self-protective thing if we've been in a situation that felt life-threatening even if it wasn't literally life-threatening as a child depending on our adults if our adults fail to meet the needs or for whatever reason or again, for whatever reason, end up becoming a threat to us, at least in our perception. Big person yelling at little person can seem very threatening, very dangerous. Because our survival depends on the relationship with the adults, it feels life-threatening and it goes in such that we say like, okay, no more, like I can't, I can't take these chances, my life depends on it. I'm not gonna go into situations where I'm putting that at risk. And I think that if you can recognize that and have a lot of compassion for that and maybe some admiration to say this kid was in an absolute mental, emotional, energetic shitstorm and, and came up with this solution to survive to the point that I can sit here now and unpack this and got me from what felt like a life-threatening scenario to this moment now. There should be admiration, appreciation, beyond just basic compassion and understanding, I've come to admire the parts of me that worked to adapt and survive however it got done. It wasn't pretty, but it, it, it got the job done. And because of that, I now enjoy the luxury of sitting here and unpacking these ideas. And I think that we all have that opportunity to go in and really look at what it is underlies the behaviors, whether it's our own or other people's, that we're trying to understand and, and relate to ourselves and each other from a more informed and wise place, right? So this is, this is why I think it's important we start taking the different models we work with and sitting them next to each other and figuring out if these pieces go together and if maybe there's a, a unifying underlayment that we can work with instead of saying I have that social anxiety, I have avoidant attachment, I have da, da 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 Go in and be like, look, under all of that is the same basic program. Let's go in and work with that program and through understanding it and engaging with it and applying what what that brings and what that yields, right? Because it shows up with certain advantages and when we work it, it yields other advantages. So it's it's taking it on and integrating it into our own process and applying it in a way that allows us to say okay I see what's happening here and I have again compassion and regard for the part of me that's going hey I'm sounding the alarms this isn't good we can't do this say okay hey I understand and I get where you're coming from and thank you for looking out I know that you've been through some stuff to get me here but also we're here now it's okay and in, in understanding that this is a different circumstance, different set of circumstances, a different condition under which we're operating, we can choose intelligently, maybe not at a deep level. I think it's through using the intelligence to execute a different program to see the results and repeat until it does really get integrated at a deeper level. There is, there is something to be said for fake it till you make it with regard to these things. You've got to kind of create the experience, the reference experience that kind of breaks down the self-limiting beliefs that this is how it is, this is how I am, this is how the world is, and say, is that so? Is that so? What about this? 
What about how when you did it differently, this time you got different results? And we know that insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. So if insanity is your mission, steady on, you're, you're on the right track. But <clears throat> to attain a greater state of clarity and peace and to be able to function as an adult in real time at a healthy level that yields productivity and and contentment I think contentment is one of my big goals and not in the way that just end up being passive but in the way that I'm content when a challenge arises I'm content with the work at hand I'm content with the struggles I face like really content to understand the whole thing and be able to put it together and to show up put together enough to meet that and yeah, to move in that direction, I think it's important we go in and we do these updates and we establish a different tone and relationship with those parts of ourselves that, yeah, definitely can be problematic if they haven't been tended to, but in saying, okay, I hear there's a problem, turn off the alarms, come here, let, let me hear what's going on, let's work with that, let's make moves in that direction, because again, taking action is an incredible remedy for that overwhelm, that anxiety, that dread, that whatever. And it also shows the part of us that feels helpless and despairing and shameful. Look, you can do it. You can do it and you keep doing that until that's, that's the pattern that gets etched in and it runs deeper than the other patterns. Because I know I started just thinking a little bit about how these things might be related, the, the avoidant attachment and social anxiety. But it's really just an example of how so many other things relate in this way that they do have a common foundation and that going to that foundation allows for this process allows for us to engage and process and apply what we get from that to get different results to show ourselves because we're we're data gathering sensors and if we're, we're putting in data that says, yup, see, you can't do it, yup, see, you suck, yup, see, everybody hates you, yup, see, everybody's bad, yep, whatever, whatever nasty little message is running on the freaking PA system in your head, come in and be like, okay, prove it, you know, habeas corpus, show me what you got, oh, what about this, what about that, question well, right, say, is that so, and, and really get inside of the fact that Often, it may be so to an extent such that, but it's a smaller piece of the picture, if it's part of the picture at all. Usually, for the most part, it's not true. And if we can identify that, embrace that, act that out, and show ourselves that there is another way, that's, that's the key to un unlocking ourselves from this bondage of dysfunctional behavior and, and unsatisfying life outcomes so okay that was more than I meant to put into it but this is how I do it it occurs to me I jump on I share and I thank you for indulging me and coming along for yet another exploration of these ideas as they arise for me I do hope it helps I hope it helps give some basis for challenging your thinking and some insight that might help move that thought process in a different direction, hopefully a direction that brings you to that place of greater contentment and agency. This is a word we hear a lot lately, We're talking about being agentic and empowered and capable of doing these things. That's the key to being able to ride the waves effectively. We're never going to get to the happy place and just settle in and be, be like scratching our bellies with delight for the rest of forever. That would get old really fast. We, we're novelty seeking animals. That would drive us crazy. What we need is the ability to enjoy riding the waves as they come and not try to control them, not argue with them, not apply stories to them. Just get out there and ride the waves and I hope this helps you to get your stance and catch that wave and ride it to where you want to be. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Bye-bye.